Our next speaker will be Erin Cordes, and she will be talking to us about manure management and temperature impacts on gas concentrations in monoslope cattle facilities. The presentation I'm speaking on today is a component of a, a multi-state, multi-institution project that we've been working on the last three years. We're looking at the air quality and the environment uh, within monoslope beef cattle facilities. And so, um, what is a monoslope beef cattle facility? If you didn't happen to see Dr. Mindy Spee's presentation earlier this morning, or right before lunch, I should say, uh, what these facilities are is a, it's a, a type of facility that's gaining popularity in our in South Dakota region and, and in the states surrounding South Dakota, where cattle production is, is being brought under roof. Uh, these monoslope facilities in particular have a, a large opening on the south side and then a smaller opening on the north side, which then provides the cattle some protection from the wind in the winter, some of the harsher winds in the winter, and then in the summer provides some shade. And then in, in the winter also it allows some of the sun to get in there and provide a little bit of extra heating. So there, there's the cattle comfort aspect to these, to these barns, which is, is part of their popularity. Um, they also, they're a smaller footprint for cattle production and then there's the reduced runoff risk compared to an open lot type system. And then um, there's, also aspects in terms of the, the worker environment where the workers aren't um, as exposed to working in the, in the mud and, and such, especially under rainy conditions. So we're seeing, seeing more of these barns in our, in our region and monoslope style with a single slope roof is one particular style. These barns have a, the style that we're monitoring have a solid floor where there's different types of manure management. So like I said, this is a, a, um, a large project it has a couple different components. What I'm going to focus on today are the gross impacts of manure management and seasonal temperatures on the gas concentrations in these facilities. The team that's, that's working on this project that was funded through the USDA, USDA AFRI Air Quality Program includes um, South Dakota State University, including um, Faye, who just spoke on, on a component of these barns. Uh, the USDA Meat Animal Research Center with, with Mindy Spees, Iowa State University Extension, which includes Angie, and then the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center. Really at the, at the heart of this project, though, is a stakeholder advisory group that, of producers, agribuilders, and, um, and scientists that came together even before this project, um, well, as a result of some initial projects, came together to really ask the, the questions that needed needed answers, and all through this have been, um, you know, pressing for a better understanding of the science that uh, behind these type of cow facilities. That's not me, right? <laughs> so our overall project is to establish a set of baseline emission values for gas concentrations and particulate matter, similar to a NAMES type study, but for these monosote beef cattle facilities. Uh, now, um, we want to establish these baseline emission data, but we also then want to tie them into the manure management practices that are, are typical of these facilities, which I'll talk about in a minute. The you know, this pressing or this, uh, this pressure for some more emission data is related to regulations, especially related to ammonia and particulate matter when it comes to, to beef cow production. Um, the producers that we're working with are also interested in air quality, they have air quality concerns when it comes to their, to their own production systems. They've noticed some time of day effects or seasonal effects and they want some understanding of, of how that happens. But really what it comes down to and what they <laughs> seem to ask us all the time is are they doing it right? They want to know is the manure management practices that they're employing, is that, is that the best way um, from an environmental standpoint? They have their, their um, observations from the production standpoint and they want to understand better the environmental standpoint of, of what they're doing. So with our, the approach to this study was using two, mo two mobile instrument shelters. 
Each mobile instrument shelter rotated between two barns, two barns in South Dakota, two barns in Iowa. In uh, South Dakota, our two barns employed a, a weekly scrape type system or a scrape and haul type manure management system wherein each week, once or twice a week, the barns would be bedded down um, and then the manure would be removed once a week as well and either stored or then applied. In the two barns in Iowa, they, the producers allowed a bed pack to establish and Faye just talked about that whole bed pack concept where, where in the manure and the, the bedding accumulate and compress over time so that you have a mound type system in the middle of these barns. The basic uh, opening height dimensions for all four barns that we monitored were very similar. At two of the barns, we, um, we monitored two pens in each of these barns. So for two barns, that ended up being the full barn. Each pen was about 250 to 300 head capacity. For two of the other barns, um, one in South Dakota, one in Iowa, they ended up being partial barn, barn monitoring. For example, at one of our barns in South Dakota, it was actually, I think, nine pens long, and we monitored two of them. So we collected data for one month each season or four times a year from each of these barns over a two-year period. With our monitoring scheme, we focused our measurements on the, the north side and the south side of these barns. On the, the south side, which in the, at least the summer conditions would predominantly be an inlet to these barns, we had um, sort of two sampling points or one sampling point per pen. And then on the north side, we had three sampling points per pen or, or six sampling points in total. Our monitoring methodology uh, was, uh, like I said, uh, focused on our north and south wall openings. We, this is a picture of our north wall opening. Uh, they have curtains on these openings to provide a bit more extra protection in the winter. These uh, curtains can be opened or closed to impact that airflow through the barn um, under different weather conditions. And uh, we can, because of those adjustable openings, we did have to adjust our measurement as well over the seasons. For gases, we, uh, over these month-long periods, essentially continuously monitored or at least sequentially sampled around our sampling points. These different gases, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, methane, carbon dioxide, and, and also nitrous oxide. I forgot to mention that here. Uh, Mindy has already talk, talked about our periodic particulate matter measurements that we, that we did as well. Now, it's, the airspeed and airflow data for these barns doesn't pertain as much to this experiment or to this particular um, presentation today, but we did measure the airspeed with anemometers, two or three D anemometers in the openings in the north and south wall. And then, of course, there was the support, supporting environmental, animal, and management data that was collected continuously or for each season with, in addition to our weather station data. With this uh, particular format or style of barns, because it's naturally ventilated, it has its obvious challenges when it comes to airflow and concentration monitoring. These barns do have the large openings in the north and south wall, so that's where we, where we focused it. Um, but because it's naturally ventilated, our inlets and outlets to these barns are pretty much at the whim of Mother Nature. So they are always... Um, changing which one is our inlet and which one is our outlet. Our airflow assumption or how we're, we're looking forward, moving forward with the airflow data for these barns is our south wall opening airflow is our perpendicular velocity times this opening area. And similarly for the north wall, it's that opening area perpendicular velocity times the area. Assuming constant air density, we want to see the south wall opening airflow equal to that north wall opening airflow. And while I don't have the data here to, to show you, the, that assumption is holding up fairly well with our, with our data, especially in the summer when that rear curtain or that curtain in the north wall of these barns is open. In the winter, when that curtain is closed up to within a couple of inches, that agreement is not holding. Um, we are seeing a nice relationship, but it's definitely not what's coming. What we measured going in is not measured going out. But um, 
If we just kind of look at that relationship with our airflow direction and concentration and inlet versus outlet uh, measurements, this is an example 24 hour period of, of uh, hourly means measured in the barn. And this particular graph up here is the airflow out of the south wall. So this essentially is a north wind, a wind from the north to the south. And this area here would be a, a south wind or the wind from the south to the north. When that wind was blowing from the north, we see our south wall concentrations higher than our, than our north wall. So our south wall at this point was acting as our outlet. And then when the wind switched, so did our inlet and outlet conditions. Now, this relationship is really nice to see when it does come to emission, uh, emission calculations. But what we're really focused on in this particular study is the, the air quality or just the concentration. So what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is hourly maximum concentrations. And what, what I mean there is that for each hour, the maximum measurement between the south wall or the north wall, that's the, I'm going to consider that our exhaust concentration and more indicative of, of what the conditions were, um, sort of the maximum conditions were in this barn over time. So over this two-year monitoring period, we saw the temperatures fluctuate from minus 30 to plus 30 degrees Celsius, which is pretty typical of South Dakota. Nice 60-degree temperature swing there. And uh, the temperatures that we monitored at our, at our weather station were very similar to what we measured in the barn with these naturally ventilated systems. There really wasn't a whole lot of difference. In certain conditions, we can see a, a slight separation in those values, but but for the most part, they're, they're fairly equal. Similar, uh, similar data that we saw in Iowa, they didn't get quite as cold in the winter, um, but uh, again, they got up to 30 degrees Celsius in the, in the summer months. So while we had this great range of temperature conditions, um, we, we really wanted to just get a handle on some of these gross effects of temperature. And so we looked at sort of our seasonal means for temperature conditions. So if we kind of arbitrarily selected our seasons, fall, winter, um, spring, summer, fall, winter, I should say, for each year, and when we grouped the data, we saw that the temperatures um, with, between our four sites were, were nowhere near each other. So it wasn't really fair to go ahead and do a comparative study of seasons um, just based off of of these designations, these seasonal designations. So what I'm, what I'm going to show in, the, in my next couple of slides is our results. And instead of really going by spring, summer, fall, winter type seasons, I'm just going to, it's going to be a regression type analysis based on these seasonal temperature means. When we look at the seasonal mean for hourly maximum ammonia concentrations, showing both the pack systems and the scrape systems on the same graph. When we look at the seasonal means for the pack systems, it ranged anywhere from just above 0 ppm up to about 6.5 ppm. For the scrape systems, the range was much tighter, from little over half a ppm up to 3.5 ppm. Now with the scrape systems, we are removing the manure on a very well, a weekly basis. So the manure isn't aging very much in these particular systems. Whereas in the pack systems, the manure can, is accumulated for many, many months. So we do see different patterns um, in, the, in the concentrations, especially when we start looking at temperature. The scrape systems, there was no um, significant uh, relationship with, with the seasonal average temperature. With the pack systems, there was a trend toward um, a relationship with temperature, but it wasn't, a, uh, wasn't significant to a, to a large extent, just a start of a trend there. So that kind of comes back to what um, Faye just was talking about too with some of her systems with the, the small simulated bat packs, um, able to detect some quite large differences with temperature. With, uh, when we get to the larger barn system, some of these effects might get slightly muted. And we also have a lot of other impacts happening within the full barn system compared to just looking at the bed pack. With, with hydrogen sulfide, the relationship with, with temperature was much more pronounced, but it was also um, fairly different between the two types of systems. 
as the temperature increased, or that seasonal mean temperature increased from about minus 12 to upwards of 27 degrees Celsius, we saw an increase in these hourly maximum hydrogen sulfide concentrations for both the scrape and the pack systems. When we start looking at the somewhat of a general trend or the type of regression between those, for every um, one degree C temperature rise in um, with the scrape systems, our maximum concentrations for hydrogen sulfide only increased 1.3 ppm ppb, I should say. With the pack systems, for that same one degree temperature rise, the increase was 10 ppb. Now I am talking on the ppb, PPB range. These measurements weren't um, exorbitantly high by any means, um, but it does start to look at, it does start to speak to some of the different mechanisms for gas formation that are happening in these pack systems versus these scrape systems. With the scrape systems, we do have, um, obviously, um, as Faye alluded to, um, some more anaerobic conditions that do develop over time in these compressed packs. And so this hydro the increase in hydrogen sulfide with the pack systems is not that, not that surprising either. Just coming back to those pack systems, the data that I showed for the pack systems was two different barns, right? We had, had eight measurements in uh, two different barns. Because of this, this curve and this increased variation with time, I did want to double check that is one of these sets of data one barn and one another barn. And while well, one barn had a fairly, fairly nice, not linear, but fairly nice increasing relationship, the other barn was quite over the, quite all over the place a little bit as the temperature increased. So it kind of speaks to more mechanisms happening there than just the straight temperature effect. When it comes to the methane, we didn't see any relationship, uh, any significant relationship with temperature um, over the range. And so what we draw from that is that when it comes to the barn system, the majority of the ammonia is, um, is from the cow versus the manure system. So with the bed pack system, we would expect to see some more methane coming off it as it ages, um, but it just, uh, when, it, when it is in addition to what the cattle are producing, we're not seeing that in that gross impact there. So in summary, when it comes to our two types of manure management systems for these barns, the pack system and the uh, scrape, scrape and haul type system, we saw uh, an impact of temperature, a trend toward an impact of temperature with ammonia or the pack system, but not the scrape system. Um, we saw an impact of, of temperature for both the pack and the scrape systems when it comes to H2S concentrations, but we didn't see any relationship with temperature for methane. So where this um, work is going is we have some more uh, relationships to look at. Here we were focused on seasonal type effects of temperature. When we start to look at diurnal effects of temperature and we start looking at time of day effect, we can start looking at time of day effects. Some of the producers that we're working with um, believe that when the cattle get up off the pack in the morning that a, a rush of ammonia is released. And so they're really looking for us to, to see if we can discern that in our data as well. So we have some more of these analyses to do on the just the concentration side of things, the air quality within the barn. But then of course we also have our emission um, data to calculate. So now that we've moved forward with, with some of our airflow data um, uh, and we're getting a, a good handle on our concentration data, we're moving towards getting that emission database. And this will all be tied in with the work that Faye is doing and that um, Mindy Spees is doing that has looked at some of these, more of these mechanisms or factors related to just the bed pack itself so that we can explain what some of these, uh, trying to attribute some of these differences or impacts that we're seeing. I do, um, as a last note, want to highlight a couple of upcoming activities we have related to this overall project. With the uh, LPLC webinars, we have one scheduled on May 17th related to this monoslope barn project, and it's going to be focused on monoslope barn management. And we, we're planning to bring in a panel of producers to talk about how and why they manage their barns the way they do. On July 19th, the webinar for that day, we plan to discuss the, the research results from this project. 
Also, our, um, our extension committee, or our extension component of this project is uh, looking to host a cattle housing conference November 21st in Sioux Falls. So I wanted to bring those events to everybody's attention so that you can stay tuned for more details.